Hello, my name is Tim Pierce. I'm the curator of mollusks here at the Carnegie Museum, and this is Science Live. I'm here to tell you about mollusks, and first we'll start out by talking about what is a mollusk, because many people don't really know. So how do mollusks fit in with all of the other animals? We're going to take one of every single species in the world. There's, oh, somewhere around 3 million or 30 million. We're not really sure how many there are, because we haven't finished counting. And we're going to divide those up into major groups called phyla, or phylum for singular. And there are about 30 to 40 different phyla in the world. And the biggest one are the arthropods. The arthropods are things like crabs and lobsters and shrimp, things that have a hard exoskeleton and jointed legs. But we're here to talk about mollusks today. Mollusks are the second largest phylum. And in fact, there are more kinds of mollusks than there are those of us with backbones, the chordates. Um, and in fact, lots of times people say, think of an animal, any animal, most of the time you think of something with hair, a mammal. And the mammals are just a tiny slice of those chordates. Most of the chordates are fish. So the mollusks are definitely a force to be reckoned with. There are lots of mollusks in the world. Now within the, within the mollusks, there are eight classes of mollusks. So the mollusks are here, these, these eight. Eight class. Class is the next level down under phylum. And you have heard of at least three of those classes. You might even have eaten three classes of mollusks. Anybody eaten any mollusks? Did I hear you say <laughs> clams? Clam chowder? Well, yes, very good. So clams, oysters, scallops, things that have two shells, we call them bivalves. Bivalves because bi means two and valve means shell. So yes, some of you have eaten bivalves. That's a that's good class of mollusks. Another one that some people have eaten are the snails. The French people love to eat the snails. Uh, they call them escargot because that's the French word for snail. Oh, are you ready for a bad joke? Uh, I figured out why they don't serve snails at McDonald's or Burger King. <coughs> Those stores sell fast food and the snails are not fast. All right, so some of you have eaten escargot or you might have eaten conch fritters when you were in Florida. And those are gastropods. The gastropods over here. Gastro refers to stomach, and pod refers to foot. And so they crawl around on their bellies. We call them gastropods. Another one that most people have never, most people don't know, are mollusks, are the cephalopods. We have an example of a cephalopod here. So they've got, the octopuses have eight legs and suckers on their legs. And if you've eaten them, you've probably called them calamari. So octopus and squid. By the way, squids have the same eight legs as the octopus plus the two extra long ones for catching fish. So squids have ten. Oh, are you ready for another bad joke? Uh, how many times do you have to tickle a squid to make it laugh? Did you say ten tickles? You were right. <laughs> All right. So those, those are the three main groups of the mollusks. Um, another, I'll show you one more um, interesting one. Uh, that many people haven't seen. This one is called a chiton, that's C-H-I-T-O-N, and they're also called polyplacophorans. Uh, poly means many, plac is shell, and phora means bearing or having. And so this is an example of a chiton. It looks a little bit like the roly-polies in your backyard, but the roly-polies actually have jointed legs, so they would be examples of arthropods. Um, the chiton doesn't have the jointed legs, it just has one big sucking foot, like a snail does. And the other, the other classes of mollusks most people have never heard of, uh, so we won't talk about this. Um, so that's your whirlwind introduction to what mollusks are. And uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit more about them. Um, how do they grow? Um, this is an example of a snail, and if it were alive and wanted to be bigger, it would add more shell along this edge and continue that spiral. So this snail came out of the egg. It was very, very tiny, and it grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. So if a snail needs a larger shell, it grows a larger shell, unlike hermit crabs. If a hermit crab needs a larger shell, it has to find a larger shell. So the hermit crabs love the snails because the snails are providing homes. Now, behind me is a research collection. So as a curator, I take care of the collection, and I also do research on the collection. So just like you might go to a library and check out a book, and then you can return it when you're finished, scientists can come here and they can check out specimens to study, and then when they're finished, they can bring them back, and somebody else can study them. So I've pulled out some drawers in our collection uh, so you can see some of the 
many specimens that we have in our collection. Um, what was I going to show you? I was going to show you any time that you have a coiling animal, if it's not coiling in one plane, it can coil either right or left. So here's an example of a, of a normally right coiling snail. It's, if, you, if you start at the beginning and go toward the end, it coils clockwise, or the uh, aperture is on the right if you hold the, the beginning at the top. Um, so this one's a normally right-handed snail. Here's an example of a left-handed snail. It coils to the other, the other side, the left-handed. Um, in humans, right and left-handed is not very, um, very rare. Left-handers are not particularly scarce. But in the snail world, the left-handed shells are really rare. Uh, normally, they're on the order of one out of 10,000 or one out of 100,000. So they're really scarce. Um, in this case, though, this whole species coils left. This whole species coils right. So this is not a particularly rare one. But sometimes you'll get an example of a left-handed snail of a normally right coiling um, shell. And those are really rare. Those, uh, the, the shell collectors will pay you big money for that. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. I meant if you find a left-handed one, I would really like to see it. So that's an example of left and right. Um, coming up soon, uh, in fact, next week, I think coming on Tuesday, is coming up something we call Pi Day. So Pi, the, pi the number is 3.14. And next Tuesday is March 14th, and so that's 3-1-4. So some people call it pie day, and it sounds like pie that you eat, so people are going to be making pies. Well, here's an example of an apple snail. So you might want to make an, a pie out of an apple snail. So the apple snail says, hello and happy pie day to you. <clears throat> also coming up next week is St. Patrick's Day. So St. Patrick's Day, um, so they celebrate green. So I brought an example of a very green snail, so you can see it. This is an interesting land snail, or a tree snail, and they live in um, only one island in the Pacific. Um, that's the only place that they can be found. And uh, that, uh, that's in uh, the Solomon Island groups, Manus Island. That's the only place that these bright green tree snails live. Now these are green, and so it makes sense that they're living up in trees, uh, the green might provide camouflage, right? But there are some other examples of these snails that um, also live in trees. Where did it go? Here's one. So this one also lives in trees, and this one is not green. So I don't know this for sure, but I'm speculating. Sometimes they can have a green body, and the green body can shine through the transparent shell so it can provide camouflage. So this one might have a green body, but this one has a green shell. That's very interesting. So happy St. Patrick's Day all of you. Um, I've also brought in an example of a carrier shell. So the carrier shell is a very interesting one. Um, so this is a snail. You can see the snail here on the bottom. And um, so if it wanted to grow, it would add more shell along this edge and continue that spiral. Now this shell, the snail, picks up other shells that it likes, I guess, and then it holds it in place as its, shell, its own shell is hardening. And then over time, it collects, it has a nice little shell collection there. So all the way from when it was a baby, it started collecting things and gluing it onto its own shell. We don't know why it does that, but they do that. So this one likes um, long, spindly things. Here's another example of one that likes clamshells. And so it glued some clamshells onto its shell. And it's not doing it haphazardly. It's doing it very carefully. Look, they're all positioned concave upward. So this is a very good home decorator. And here's another example. This one liked to collect rocks or pebbles, rounded pebbles. So here's the snail and it's gluing rocks onto its shell. So again, we don't know why they're doing that, but um, that's something that they do. It could be, some people say it could be for camouflage and that's possible, but a lot of these live really deep in the ocean, so deep that there's no light. And so why would you need camouflage if there was no light? Um, it's possible, I'm going to make up a new word here, tactile camouflage. Tactile means touching. And so it's possible that they are using these shells for tactile camouflage. So if there's a creature feeling along and looking for a snail, is this a snail? Oh no, that's just a pile of dead shells. And then they move on. So it's possible that they would have tactile camouflage. But that's a word that I just made up.
let's see, what else have we got? We've also got some purple snails, so there must be some holidays coming up with purple. This is an interesting snail. Um, they blow bubbles. They live in the ocean, and they blow bubbles until they form a raft, and then they float around on this raft of bubbles their whole life in the ocean. And uh, then when they bump into a jellyfish, the snail eats the jellyfish. And uh, that's how they make their living their whole life. They blow bubbles and, and, and float around on the raft. I've um, seen pictures of them ganging up on a Portuguese man of war. So they can, they can eat big jellyfish, they can eat smaller jellyfish as well. So that's a good purple snail for the purple holiday that's coming up. All right, how are we on time? Um, all right, do you have some questions? Has anybody got some questions for me? All right, uh, Mrs. Upton's fourth grade class wants to know what makes snails slimy? And that's a very good question. Um, it's mucus is what it is, and mucus makes the world go round. So if you think about it, the outside of a snail is like the inside of your nose. The inside of your nose is slimy. And so the outside of the snail is slimy. They are, they're using the slime for a number of different reasons, but one of the most important ones is to help prevent evaporation, it's to help keep from drying out. Land snails, if you think about land snails, they're like leaking bags of water trying to survive on dry land. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but they seem to be very successful. Or a slug, think about a slug. The outside of the slug is just like the inside of your nose. It's a, it's a mucous membrane, and they don't want to uh, dry out. So the mucus is there to help them uh, prevent from drying out. The mucus is also used, very important, for, for moving, and uh, they can crawl. They, they, they lay down a, a, a road of slime, and then they crawl across it. And they can crawl up walls, they can crawl on the ceiling. Um, there's a famous line from a movie called Apocalypse Now, where a snail crawls across a razor blade without getting cut. And that's true, they can do that, thanks to this marvelous slime that they have. All right, we have another question coming in. What was the largest shell ever discovered? <clears throat> well, first, before we talk about the largest shell, let's talk about the largest mollusk. The largest mollusk is the giant squid. They can be as long as a school bus. So the giant squid um, is also interesting because it has the largest eye of any animal in the animal kingdom. Uh, it's the size of a volleyball. And it's probably that big because they live really deep in the ocean and there's not much light down there. So they need a big eye to gather enough light to be able to see. So the giant squid is definitely the largest mollusk. Now the uh, largest shell is probably the giant clam. So way in the back, you might be able to see um, an example of a giant clam. This is not a particularly large giant clam. The largest one, well they can be almost two meters long, which is pretty big, a two yards long. Um, so that's a very large giant clam. Uh, one of the really cool things about giant clams is that in their bodies, when they're alive, inside of their bodies, They've got algae, microscopic plants, inside their bodies. So in the daytime, they open up and the sun shines down and the algae grows and makes food for the clam. And the clam gives the algae a safe place to live. And so we call that symbiosis when they live together. They're living together as happy as an algae. That's a joke. Um, now, light, light normally penetrates body tissue about a centimeter or a third of an inch. But in the giant clams, they've got these special silica bodies that allow the light to penetrate six centimeters. And so the top six centimeters of these giant clams is packed with algae. And those algae are all photosynthesizing and the clam um, gets a lot of energy from them. And I think that that's why they can grow so big and, and fast. They grow relatively quickly also. Um, so the giant clams are really pretty amazing. Um, so that's, oh, and one more thing about the giant clams. Um, Skin divers get their feet caught in giant clams only in the movies or the cartoons. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but movies are not necessarily reality. Um, so don't worry about getting your foot stuck in a giant clam. It only happens in the movies. All right, we have another question. What made me want to be a, re a snail researcher? Well, I've always been interested in nature. And in fact, my mother tells me that I was collecting snails at age of three. Uh, so I've I've been interested in snails along with all of the other parts of nature uh, ever for my whole life. I started getting seriously interested about snails in uh, my second year in college. I needed to do a term paper. I needed to write a, a, a special paper uh, and do a project. And so I studied the slugs on campus. I was living in the Pacific Northwest where there are lots of slugs, probably because it's very wet. It rains all the time. And uh, so I chose slugs. And uh, ever since then, 
I've been I've been hooked on snails and slugs. And I think one of the reasons that I chose snails is I like things that move. We all like things that move, but birds move a little bit too fast. Oh, 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 I couldn't quite see if it had a white eye ring. And plants move, but plants move pretty slowly. Snails move just right. I can keep up with a snail. And their shells are, are convenient. If, if you want, you can paint a number on the shell and let it go, and then come back later and see if you can find it and see how far it moved. So snails are really pretty cool. Um, I also like to collect things. And, you know, butterflies are really pretty. People like to collect butterflies. But if you collect butterflies, you have to kill them. I'm sorry to, sorry to break this to you. But if you want to collect snail shells, you can find a dead snail shell and collect it. And you don't have to kill anything. So I don't like to kill, and I do like to collect. So snails is perfect for that. We have another question. How far can a snail see? Well, snails do have eyes. They don't have particularly good eyes. They can definitely tell light and dark. Um, there was an experiment where there were some, some rods, some plexiglass rods, black ones and clear ones, and black ones and clear ones, all around the arena. And they put some snails that love to climb things. And the snails went straight for the black ones and climbed those. So the snails could definitely tell black from clear. Um, so they can see, but it's not very, we're not very clear how far they can see. Uh, I'm not sure that they have very good color vision either. Um, so they might not be able to tell you apart from me if, if we had a pet snail. Um, on the other hand, octopuses and squids have very good vision. Um, octopuses, in fact, octopuses have eyes that might be superior to our eyes. If you think about our eye, the light comes in through the, through the lens and shines on the retina, and then the message has to get from the retina to the brain, and all of the nerves are on the business side of the retina, and so the nerves have to go through a hole in the retina to get to the brain, and that's our blind spot. We have a blind spot in our eyes, and that's because all of the nerves are going through there to get to the brain. The octopus has the nerves on the other side of the retina, so they don't have a blind spot, so their eyes are superior. Um, they can also see polarized light, which is something that we, that our eyes are unable to do. So octopuses, they can see pretty far, and they, can, they have very, very good vision. Another question, what is the most deadly snail? All right, um, we can talk about the killer sea snail here. Um, so these snails are um, in the family Con Conidae. They're sometimes called cone snails. Why would anybody call that a cone snail? Um, so most of them, or they, live, they all live in the ocean, and most of them eat worms. This is a worm-eating one. And they've got a hypodermic dart and they can inject venom into their prey. So it crawls up to a tasty looking worm and then jabs it and then the worm is paralyzed and uh, they can slurp it up. Do you like to eat worms? The snail says, worms are good food. So that's a, an example of a worm-eating snail. Here's an example of a snail-eating snail. And I think this is a beautiful pattern. I can't ever tell if that's teeth or if it's mountains. But it's a beautiful pattern. This is a snail eating snail. It crawls up to a tasty looking snail and then jabs it in the soft parts and paralyzes it and then eats it. They can also use their venom for protection. And this snail has killed humans. Some people have died from the sting of this snail. They live in the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So if you're, if you're out in that area and you see a beautiful snail like this, make sure it's empty before you put it in your bathing suit to take it home, because we want you to come home alive. So that's an example of a, of a snail eating snail. By the way, I'm going to make a distinction between venom and poison. One of them hurts you if you swallow it, and one hurts you if you inject it. So which one is which? Well, poison is the one you don't want to swallow. Venom is the one that you don't want to inject. So for example, um, those poisonous snakes we have, they're not poisonous, they're venomous. So you don't want to be bit by a snake, but it's okay to eat one if you want. Um, this is an example of a cone snail that is a fish-eating snail. So this one, um, it, of course, it doesn't chase the fish because it's a snail, but it waits till the fish is nearby and then jabs it really fast with its dart, and it paralyzes the fish almost instantly, and then it has a big mouth that comes out, and then they can swallow the fish. And you can see videos on YouTube if you Google cone snail feeding. Um, but I have to warn you, one of those videos, it's a picture of the snail eating uh, um, a clownfish. So if you can't stand the idea of Nemo being eaten by a snail, don't watch the 27 second one. The other ones are okay. So this one also has killed humans. And um, 
So of the 700 species in this family, uh, two are known to have killed humans. So it's not too dangerous out there in the world. Um, now, by the way, the, um, the venom that they're injecting is not just a single chemical. It's about 50 different compounds, short proteins called peptides. And um, if you go from one species to another species of cone snail, it's 50 different species of peptides. So 700 species and 50 peptides per species equals a large number. And we're, the pharmaceutical companies are very interested in those because some of them, let's see, some of them like this one from the um, Australia area have very interesting properties. One of the peptides from this guy's venom is a painkiller more powerful than morphine. Morphine is a very strong painkiller. Um, and without the side effects, you don't get addicted and you don't build up a tolerance. So it's being used in humans right now as a painkiller. Better living through snails, I like to say. So that's an uh, example of the killer, killer sea snail, um, probably the most deadliest of the mollusks. Um, another question, why are snails slow and were ancient snails slow? Well, snails are slow, well, some of them are slower than others, uh, probably because of the way that they, they crawl. So they're crawling on their bellies, they've got the, the slime, and then they, if, you, if you watch a snail, if you ever get a live snail, put it on a piece of glass and look at it from underneath, and you can see waves of progression. So the, snail, the snail's foot is, is attached to the substrate, it's not lifting its foot up usually. There are a few cases where it does. But it's, it's attached to the, the, the bottom, but then it sort of contracts and, and restricts its, the bottom of its foot, kind of like a slinky moving along, uh, and that's how they move. So they're, re they're confined to how quickly they can make those waves of progression go. Um, on the other hand, some mollusks are very quick. Squids, uh, some squids can uh, go through the ocean so quickly they can jump out of the water and land on the deck of the ship. Uh, so they're going to they're traveling pretty fast. So some squids are pretty fast, mollusks in general are pretty slow. There are some, uh, the fastest snail in the world is Biomphalaria glabrata. It's a freshwater snail, and the reason I say it was the fastest snail in the world is it was on the space shuttle. It was being used in an experiment on the space shuttle, and the space shuttle's going around the world, what, 22,000 kilometers an hour? That's a pretty fast snail, I would say. Um, so do we have another question? Does, does a snail become a slug if it leaves its shell? Um, this will be our last question. Um, so the, uh, a snail and a slug are really the same, same thing. A, you can think of a slug as like a snail with, without a shell, but in fact, most slugs have an internal shell. If you find a slug, the internal shell is about maybe a tenth as long as the, as the slug. And so if you feel gently, especially the leopard slugs, um, you can feel it on them, or if you're out west, the banana slugs. So just uh, pinch gently and you can feel the shell inside. So most slugs do have an internal shell. Um, and so evolutionarily, the snails came first, and then the slugs evolved from the snails by reducing the size of the shell and then internalizing it. So most of the slugs do have internal shells. We do have a few slugs that don't have any shell at all, but they still have the sac where the shell would be. Um, so um, that's, uh, yes. So uh, snails actually cannot leave their shells. They're attached to their shells, just like you're attached, your muscles are attached to your bones. And so um, a snail would probably not survive too long if you, if you took it out of its shell. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me and uh, learning about the fascinating world of mollusks. Talk to you later.